Okay, I went out looking for an orbit simulator or a gravity simulator. Uh, interestingly, it's called gravitysimulator.com, and if you actually type in that, you'll get the same spot, but it's now called orbitsimulator.com. And if you go here, I'm just, I'm just gonna demonstrate this thing. Uh, it says the browser version, that's what we want. Okay, here is the simulation. By default, we're starting with the solar system, including Pluto, which is here in red, uh, which is not today considered a planet, but the rest of these are planets. Um, let's look at this. If I do this, I can zoom in. So here's the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. If I zoom out, here's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus in green, Neptune in blue, and then Pluto is the one here in red. If I tilt this thing like this, I'm looking down on the solar system. Here's edge on. Here's looking from underneath, which will do nothing but confuse you, so let's not do that. So there we go. All right. In fact, we're going to basically look at it from this angle, from above. You can do what you like. This is another kind of zooming, which simply is a scaling of the output. Okay. This, this zoom literally moves the camera in and out. And this one scales the output after it's all been computed. So, uh, whichever, it doesn't probably matter much which of those you use if you just want to see little things and make them bigger. Uh, this uh, changes the azimuth so you can look at it from different angles. That makes more sense probably if you're looking like this. And I want to see it from over here or over here, so forth. All right. So from our purposes, uh, we probably don't care much about the azimuth because we're going to do a special little project here. So I'm going to change this back so the x-axis looks horizontal. This is clearly the x-axis. I'm not quite sure what this line represents. The best I can tell is just vertical on the map regardless. So regardless of, excuse me, regardless of the tilt here, or even if I change the azimuth and then tilt it again, it stays vertical there. So I really don't quite understand that. If this is the x-axis three-dimensionally, uh, if this is horizontal like this, this looks like it's the z-axis. So here's x and here's y off here somewhere, and here's z, but uh, whatever. I'm just gonna leave x to the right. Let's do some things here. What I'm gonna be doing is stripping away the solar system and creating a little simulation that involves the sun and Jupiter and a, I'm going to put in a comet because I want to show you some gravitational effects that one body can have on the other. If I just hit the run button by the way, notice these things start creeping along. Up here you can see that the time is advancing slowly. Here's the months going by and so forth. JD stands for Julian Day. That's like counting time in days sometime from ancient history so that you don't have to mess with years, months, and days, and so forth. Uh, let's pause it. Uh, and let's see. I'm going to start stripping things away so that we can do our demonstration. So I'm going to, first of all, let's do this. Tilt it up. I come up to Objects. And I'm going to say delete objects. I'm going to delete everything except Jupiter and the sun. So I'll start checking these boxes. There's Jupiter. I'll leave it alone. And there's the sun. Okay, delete selected. There we go. That's Jupiter and that's the sun. And let's go ahead and make it a little bit more visible. Notice that Jupiter is showing a phase. In other words, only the half of Jupiter that faces the sun is illuminated. For our purposes in this little demo, that's going to get in the way. I'd rather just uh, show a dot for Jupiter. And so let's do that. So to find the little place where you can turn phases on and off, you have to uh, get into what's called frame A, hit A. I don't think that's documented very well, but there it is. I had this long conversation with the author and got filled in on a few little tricks of the trade here. And so one of the things that you can specify here is phases. And if I uncheck that box, look at that, the phase went away and I see a solid dot. That's going to be easier to see. That's the only reason I'm turning that off. 
And there's other things here. Like, for instance, see that picture of the sun? If I turn off the sun graphic, I just see a dot for the sun. The picture looks a little nicer. and I'm just going to leave the, uh, the graphic sun there. If I let it run, it's moving that fast. I want it to move faster. So I go to Preferences. And this is not easy to understand without me explaining it to you. So here's what's happening. Uh, the speed that these things are going is not based on uh, some sort of a calendar that it's computing or anything like that. It's based on how fast the computer is able to uh, do its computations. And so uh, computing the steps, this is going step, 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 step as it moves around. Each time it's reevaluating the forces acting on the object and so forth, and finding the accelerations, and then advancing it one little step. Instead of displaying it every time, displaying everything is the slow part because then you're interacting with other hardware in your computer. So this goes a hundred steps and then displays it once. So every single uh, display, it's already computed a hundred little steps in between. So that's where you get the fine resolution, so you get accuracy, but then uh, uh, you don't have it slowed down. I want it to go faster, so let's just let it go a thousand steps between, and let's see how that goes. That's a lot better. You can go faster than that if you want, but that's about the speed I want it. Okay. Notice that um, uh, half of this orbit looks like it's um, bright. And the other half of the orbit looks dimmer. Uh, this is the half of the orbit of Jupiter. The orbit is tilted, so that here's the line of intersection. The flat plane of the solar system as defined by the Earth's orbit, that's called the ecliptic plane. And Jupiter's orbit is tilted just slightly with respect to that. And this is the line of intersection. If you have two tilted planes that intersect each other, they'll intersect along a line. That's called the line of nodes. And so that's what this is illustrating here. Okay, okay we're going to come back and see how that affects our the way we set up the comet too. Okay, let's, uh, let's see. Let's display a comet. So create objects. We're going to ignore everything on the right except, uh, it says reference object is the sun. We're going to have something orbiting the sun here. So we leave that alone. Uh, we're going to do one object. This stuff only applies if we're doing a whole cluster of objects at once. We're not going there right now. Uh, name of the object, we'll call it a comet. And then we put a color. Here's the default color it would give it. Let's make sure we can distinguish it from Jupiter. So I'm going to make it white. So 255, 255, 255. Those are all maxed out on all three colors. So that just makes it white. Uh, the author says he's planning to put a more sophisticated color picker in here at some point. So if you are watching this a uh, year or two down the line, it might have a better way to select the color. Radius. Uh, it says kilometers or meters are the two options here. If I click on the unit, it gives me options. But we don't care about the radius of our comet. We're not going to be worrying about collisions or anything like that. So let's just leave it zero. You could put a tiny radius if you wanted, but we really don't care. Mass. Notice if I click here, it says kilograms, Earth masses, Jupiter masses, and solar masses. Back to kilograms, okay? It turns out the mass really doesn't matter for our purposes. You know, Galileo showed that if you drop from a big rock and a pebble at the same time, they'll fall at the same rate. What this calculation program is doing is figuring out the acceleration of our object uh, moment by moment. It doesn't really go through figuring out the force. It's going directly to figuring out the acceleration. If I put a mass in here, it would use that mass to uh, uh, try to modify the orbit of Jupiter. So this Jupiter and this comet are pulling on each other. The Sun and the comet are pulling on each other. And if I wanted to compute not only the effect of Jupiter acting on the comet, but the effect of the comet acting on Jupiter, putting a mass in here would allow that to happen. It just turns out it's more efficient for calculation purposes if I just leave it as artificially at zero. 
we know that it has to have a little bit of mass in order for it to have a force in order for it to accelerate. So it's not really literally zero mass, but by leaving it zero, it means it's not going to mess with this when it's trying to figure out where Jupiter is. Jupiter is only being affected by the sun. The comet is going to be affected by Jupiter and the sun. Okay, well, that's a very artificial quantity there. But I'm going to leave it at zero just to keep the calculation more efficient. That was a hint given to me by the author. Semi-major axis. If you have a circle, then the major axis is like the diameter and the semi-major axis is like the radius. If you have an ellipse, the major axis is the long axis of the ellipse, and the semi-major axis is like the long radius. Okay, so it's a way of specifying the size of the orbit. Jupiter has a semi-major axis of 5.2 AUs, and AU, here I'll change that to AUs. So put it meters, kilometers, AUs, light years. I'm going to put it as AUs. And um, so the Earth-Sun distance is one AU. That's 93 million miles or 149 million kilometers. But it's one astronomical unit. And so relative to the Earth's orbital radius, Jupiter's orbital radius is 5.2. We want to put this comet so it crosses the orbit of Jupiter. And so I want to put this bigger than Jupiter's orbit. So let's put it up, oh, eight or nine or something like that. I'm just going to put nine. Eccentricity. That's how elongated the orbit is. If I start with zero, it'll be circular. If I say one, it'll be parabolic, which means it'll come in once, go away, and never come back. And if it's anything greater than one, it'll be hyperbolic, which means it'll even faster zip past, go out, and never come back. So I want this to be something between 0 and 1. You can experiment with different quantities. I'm going to put something like 0.8. Okay. Inclination. Now, I'm basically trying to do a two-dimensional model here. But the author told me it's important because of the way the calculation is done. Uh, remember we talked about the line of nodes for Jupiter? Well, for some of these things down here, they're referencing the line of nodes. We need to make sure that this comet has a line of nodes, which means its orbital plane has to be inclined with respect to the ecliptic, so there will be a line of intersection, which will be the line of nodes. So I just need to make sure that there's some amount of tilt. So I could put the inclination, if I just really want to minimize it, just say 0.1 or 1 or whatever, how many degrees, okay? That's in degrees. Okay, this capital omega symbol stands for the longitude of the ascending node. So if you have, say, the comet going around its orbit, every time it crosses the line of nodes, it's either crossing, coming up or down, across the plane of the ecliptic. And so the ascending node is the half of that line of nodes where it's coming up. And so that's just a way of specifying a direction for the orbit. So the longitude of the ascending node, I can put anything I want in here. Let's just put something like 60, so it's something we can recognize when we're looking at it. And this lowercase omega is what this is. That's the longitude of perihelion, uh, which is the angle from the ascending node up to the line of the axis of the ellipse. Okay. So let's put that, say, 90 degrees. Doesn't matter what that is. Excuse me, I grab and drag that. So there's 90 degrees. Okay. And just so that you can recognize it when we start off, that'll maybe help you understand what this is. So these are two angles measured in two different planes. In the plane of the ecliptic, we go from the x-axis around to uh, the ascending node, and that's 60 degrees. And then in the comet's orbital plane, we go another 90 degrees, and that gets us to the uh, periapsis or perihelion. Periapsis is generic. If you talk about orbits around the sun, that would be a perihelion. If you talk an orbit around the Earth, that's called perigee. If you have an orbit around some other planet or orbit around a star, uh, you, know, you have to make up a different name for each one. So instead of that, the generic term is periapsis. That applies to any body here. So our reference object here is the sun, so I could call that perihelion.
That's what you frequently do, but periapsis is just as good. MA stands for uh, the mean anomaly, and which is sort of an exotic term. Basically, it's talking about the starting point uh, in terms of how far around the orbit is the this comet when it starts out. So let's put 180 degrees just so that it'll start at the far point from the sun. If I put zero, it would be at perihelion, just so that we can get a feel for these angles here. And let's say create. And there it is. And now let's take the orbit. We have to do that separately. Take objects, orbits, and check comet, and say generate. And there we go. And let's just see what we have for a second. Here's the x-axis. And notice we put 60 degrees in for the longitude of the ascending node. So this line between these two points where the comet's orbital plane crosses the ecliptic plane, that's at a 60 degree angle. And then relative to that line, we come around 90 degrees, which is over to here. And that's where the perihelion point is. That's the close point to the sun in this ellipse. And then we put an MA or a mean anomaly of 180 degrees so we're way around here. So that's our starting point. Now, before we do any more, I'm going to do something. I'm going to come up here and save it. And just to set, tell you, this is done in JavaScript, and it's sort of an older version of JavaScript, at least when this was originally written, where you could not save anything on the user's computer. So this is going to get saved on the server uh, for the author's server for this. So. You, when you save it, it's on his machine. And here's the way he's handling it. So I say for simulation name, give it a name. I'm going to call it uh, Comet Slingshot. Okay, so we're going to de demonstrate the slingshot effect of with a comet here. And I can put other stuff in or not, but that's all I need. Now watch this here. If I say save, and just wait. A second or two, there it is. This is a URL. I right clicked on it and say copy link address. All right, so I've copied that. And let's bring up a little notepad here and let's drop it in there. So if I save this somewhere and then if I want to start over and come back to this, I'll be able to reconstruct this. Um, starting point, so I don't have to do all that work all over again. Okay, now let's try running it. Okay, so first, th first off, we have the comet here doing an elliptical orbit. Kepler's first law for planetary motion is that the planets, also comets, anything orbiting the sun, will go in an elliptical orbit. And it'll be an ellipse where the sun is at one focus. So that's one focus of this ellipse. The other focus is over here. There's nothing over here. Okay, so that's the first law. Second law is notice it's uh, moving slower out here and faster in here. And it does that in such a way that if I took a line from the sun to the comet, that line would sweep out equal areas in equal amounts of time. So here it'll go slowly around this end quickly around this end, okay? And the third law has to do with how its orbital period varies with the size of the orbit, okay? So uh, that's the basic things. However, Kepler's laws are based on uh, this comet only being affected by the sun and nothing else. But that's really not the reality. What Newton was able to do was to derive Kepler's laws from the law of gravitation. And so if you apply Newton's law of gravitation to this comet, it's going to be affected by the gravitational force of both the Sun and Jupiter and all the other planets, but those are the only two we have in this simulation here. And so as we let it run, notice it's already a little bit off because Jupiter affected it. Now watch what happens. Notice how close it came to Jupiter there, and notice how that dropped it into a slightly lower orbit. Let's do this. Let's put trails on there and let it go. And now you see that 
uh, its orbit is being traced out. Okay. And as it comes, if it comes to a near encounter with Jupiter, it, uh, on those encounters, it would tend to change the orbit. Now, this is going to be a slow process. Whoops, that's not, that's not terribly close. If I wait for the really close encounters, like there, that's pretty close. Notice how it went in front of Jupiter. If you thought of it like this, the comet is pulling forward on Jupiter. It's tending to speed up Jupiter. It's tending to add kinetic energy to Jupiter. Not a whole lot because this is tiny and Jupiter is massive. However, the results um, is it's adding energy to Jupiter and so it's losing energy itself. So my prediction is that by passing in front of Jupiter, it's going to drop to a slightly smaller orbit. Let's see what happens. Not very noticeable. Okay. Look at this one. This time it's going to go behind Jupiter, and so Jupiter is going to pull forward on the comet and tending to accelerate it, it should go to a higher orbit. And that one is noticeable. Okay. Now, these changes, they're, they're tiny. some of them are small, so they're hard to notice. So what I'm going to do is change this around a bit. I'm going to come up to the objects, and let's go to Edit Objects, and this says Elements. The orbital elements are the description of the orbit. The vectors is like, where is Jupiter right now? How fast is it moving right now? Things like that. We don't want to mess with that. I just want to go to the description of the orbit. And let's set this for Jupiter. And uh, down here says the mass in terms of Earth masses. But if I click it, it's in terms of Jupiter's masses. So Jupiter, as you might expect, has one Jupiter mass. Let's make that 10. So I want to make this to be a bigger planet, the same orbit as Jupiter, but it's a bigger planet than Jupiter and it'll make a stronger effect and it will tend to uh, display this information more readily. Okay, so let's turn this off. Let's let it run a little bit. Okay. What I'm going to do, by the way, is hit C. C is for clear. So I've cleared off these trails. Uh, and let's just let it go from here. So I'm starting up the trails again. So these are the trails as ooh, it just went just behind Jupiter. Do you see that? And so Jupiter pulled forward on it, launched it to a higher orbit. Okay. Each time it comes, can you predict whether it will increase or decrease the orbit? Okay, that wasn't very close to Jupiter, so it shouldn't be very much of an effect. I'm going to pause it if I see something happening. That wasn't very close, so it's pretty much repeating itself. Boom. Looks like it's going to pass in front of Jupiter, and if it does pass in front of Jupiter, it's going to basically be trying to speed up Jupiter, which means that Jupiter is going to be gaining energy and the comet's going to be losing energy. It'll drop to a lower orbit. Let's see if that happens. And sure enough, there we go. There's some other effects as well. So uh, uh, when you uh, do this and play with it, the thing is to notice all the various ways that the gravitational uh, forces interact. Okay, So by going around a few times you can get this thing changing into wildly different orbits. This is, by the way, a real thing that happens. This is called the slingshot effect. You have comets from the Oort cloud, which is way out at the fringes of the solar system. As they fall into the inner solar system, if they pass near Jupiter, they could either be launched into outer space never to come back. Whoops, that was a close encounter. We'll drop to a lower orbit there. It can either be launched into essentially given escape velocity, so it leaves and never comes back, or it can be dropped into a lower orbit and be captured into something that's closer to the size of Jupiter's orbit. And so we have a whole bunch of what's called short period comets, which are comets that have been captured into 
uh, smaller orbits, and then we have other comets that are launched out of the solar system. To play with these orbits and see a lot more variability, get into the Edit Elements menu and make small changes in the semi-major axis or the mean anomaly or the eccentricity or any of those parameters. Even small changes will have dramatically different effects in terms of the orbits as they progress. The nature of the interaction between the comet and Jupiter is very sensitive to initial conditions.